love your neighbor. You've probably heard that before, been told that before, even if you didn't grow up in church or don't have much background with the Bible and Christianity, you've heard that phrase before. And whether you believe in God or not, you probably think it's a good idea to, to love your neighbor, to, to love other people. And it's a really simple idea. It's a really simple command that we see throughout the scriptures that we're going to find here in Galatians chapter 5 as we study God's word this morning to love our neighbor, that this is the call on the life of the Christian to, to love our neighbor, to love other people. And while it's a simple command and it's easy to memorize, it's easy to understand, it's really hard to do a lot of the days. It's really hard to love our neighbor, to love other people day in and day out. And the reason it's hard isn't because it's difficult to understand, but because people make it hard. You and I make it hard for other people to obey the command, right? They have to love us and we're called to, to love them and to serve them. Well, they're, they're called to love us. And yeah, sometimes they make it really hard for us to do that command. But when we're honest with ourselves, we make it really hard for them to obey the command as well. And so as we start in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, the Apostle Paul is now going to transition. He says, throughout the letter, he's been telling us what the gospel is that we have a new identity as children of God because of Jesus' forgiveness, His death on the cross, and His resurrection from the dead. And now in chapters 5 and 6, He's going to teach us how we're supposed to respond. How are we to live as Christians? What does it mean to say that I'm forgiven, I'm redeemed by Jesus, I'm a child of God, so now what? What do I do? How do I live? And so in verse 13 of Galatians chapter 5, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul is saying, you and I have been set free from the demands of the law to be perfect. We've been set free from our failures, our brokenness, our sins. We've been set free from guilt and shame. We have been forgiven, renewed, redeemed by Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. And here's how we're supposed to live in response to that. That we're set free not to live for ourselves. So when it says to indulge the desires of the flesh, it's this New Testament way of saying, like our selfish, sinful desires. So Paul's saying, you haven't been set free in order to just live for yourself. You haven't been set free so you can be self-absorbed, selfish in all of your relationships and all of your attitudes and behaviors. You and I have been set free in order to be able to love others the way God has loved us. And so Jesus loves us, he forgives us, he serves us. And Paul says, and now you get to go do the same thing for other people that are in your lives. So we're not set free to live for ourselves. We've been set free to love and serve others with the love and the attitude and the kindness that God through Jesus has given to us. So it's a simple command. I love that if you, when he's saying all of the law, so basically your whole Bible, all the things that God has told us to do, Paul says, can be summarized this way. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right. So if you've ever looked at the Bible, tried to study or read the Bible, gone, what, there's a lot here I don't understand. There's a lot here I don't get. I don't know who these people are. I don't know what's going on. What is God telling us to do? How are we supposed to live? What is God's will? What's this plan for this? Have you ever had any of those kinds of questions as you approach God's word? Paul does us a huge favor and he says, I'm going to make it really simple for you. Love your neighbor as yourself. So love people. That's it. Well, that's really Simple. Right? When we hear, what is the Christian life about? What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to follow Jesus? 
we can see all kinds of programs and books and blogs and videos made about this topic. And I love that Paul just breaks it down to this very simple idea and command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So love people. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And how do I show his love to the world? Well, I love my neighbor as myself. The tricky part is not understanding the command, but in actually doing it. Right? There's this old story. It's not true. It's just a story of a pastor giving a sermon on a specific text in the Bible. And then the next week, he gives another sermon on the exact same text. And then the next week, he gives the same sermon again. And the next week after that, he gives another sermon on the exact same text. And after a while, it's not funny anymore. It's not interesting. And the people begin to grumble. And so someone, one of the braver members of the church, came up to the pastor after the service. And said, Pastor, you know, it's a really good sermon. Everybody liked it. We really liked it the first time. The, you know, the second time was good. It was a good refresher. But now we're on like the fifth or sixth time of hearing the exact same sermon on the exact same text. And we're just wondering, when are you going to get to the rest of the Bible? The old pastor looked at his member and said, I'll start preaching on different parts of the Bible when you guys start doing this one verse. Right? And his whole point being, sometimes we look at the Bible, we're like, oh, okay, love your neighbor and stuff. That's great for this week. And the next week, let, let's find something else. And the next week, let's find something else. And so we kind of skip over the command, like, well, okay, I got it memorized. And well, the question isn't, you know, did I memorize it? The command isn't memorize this sentence. The command is to actually go and love our neighbor. And it's hard because sometimes people are selfish. They're cruel, they're mean, they're hypocritical. They sin against us, they hurt us, they disappoint us. And you're telling me I need to go and love them, not just a little bit, but to love them as much as I love myself? Well, when I'm honest, I don't want to do that. I mean, some days, okay, it's easier, it's, it's not so bad, it's enjoyable, but man, some days it's just not fun to, to have to love other people, to have to put up with other people and their shortcomings. And so we get selfish. We become self-absorbed and we start to think, no, it's all about me. There's a wonderful story that illustrates this struggle that we have of is our life about us or is it about other people is it about getting what i want out of the relationship or is it about giving love and kindness to the relationship and so here's a story from the famous author dr seuss who i absolutely adore love and it's a story called yurtle the turtle i'm only going to read a part of it on the faraway island, Asalamasan, Yurtle the turtle was king of the pond. A nice little pond, it was clean, it was neat, the water was warm, there was plenty to eat. The turtles had everything turtles might need, and they were all happy, quite happy indeed. They were until Yurtle, the king of them all, decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. I'm ruler, said Yertle, of all that I see, but I don't see enough. That's the trouble with me. With this stone for a throne, I look down on my pond, but I cannot look down on the places beyond. This throne that I sit on is too, too low down. It ought to be higher, he said with a frown. If I could sit high, how much greater I'd be. What a king. I'd be ruler of all that I see. But as Yertle the turtle lifted his hand and started to order and give the command, that plain little turtle below in the stack, that plain little turtle whose name was just Mac, 
decided he'd taken enough, and he had. And that plain little lad got a bit mad. And that plain little Mac did a plain little thing. He burped, and his burp shook the throne of the king. And as the story goes on, Yertle's throne collapses and falls down, and the story ends this way. And today, the great Yertle, that marvelous he, is king of the mud that is all he can see. And I love this story. It's a wonderful story and, and parable about pride. And what happens that instead of making our lives about loving and serving others, how easily we can wreck them and make them worse for other people and for ourselves, we make everything about us. That instead of loving my neighbor, instead of serving my neighbor, instead of being generous and kind and loving the relationship, when I become selfish, when I become self-absorbed and think this relationship is about me, this job is about me. This is about me getting ahead and above everybody else. What happens over time is that those relationships become strained. And then they begin to crack. And then they begin to break. And then eventually we're like Yertle the turtle stuck in the mud. Because this is what happens when we become selfish and self-absorbed, we think that this life is all about me and what I can get out of other people and out of relationships, it leads to pain and destruction for them and also for me. And this is what Paul teaches as he goes on in verse 15 of Galatians 5. If you bite and devour each other, Watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So there's this option for us. Paul says, you've been set free. You've been forgiven and redeemed by Jesus in order to love your neighbor. But that freedom gives us this choice. I can go and love and serve the people in my life. Or, as Paul said earlier, I can indulge the foot, I can be selfish, I can be self-absorbed and say, no, this is all about me and what I want and what I can get out of it. And so Paul gives us a warning. He says, that is an option for you. You certainly can live that way. And many of us and many people throughout history and throughout the world choose the option that says, it is all about me. It's all about my desires. It's all about my wants. It's all about what I can get out of you. So Paul gives us a warning. He says, that is an option. But here's the warning. Here's the result of living that way. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. See, as we start thinking about loving our neighbor and loving other people, it is hard work. It is difficult work. It's even painful sometimes. But Paul's whole argument is that it's a better way to live. It's better for them. And as we're going to see later, it's going to be better for you. Because the other way leads to a back and forth. A back and forth that tears them down, and then they tear me down, and then I retaliate against them. And if, if you're a human, and you've ever been wronged or hurt, there's a good chance you know what that cycle feels like. That cycle of biting back and forth at one another that eventually escalates and escalates over time that leads to us devouring each other in our relationships to the point where that relationship doesn't exist anymore because it's been destroyed. The marriage has been destroyed. The relationship with the kids or with the parents has been strained to the point where they're no longer talking to each other. It's been strained to the point where the friendship 
is over and now they're an enemy. See, this is the result of a life lived like Yertle the Turtle. I know it's a kid's story, but there's a powerful lesson in it. That when I think life is all about me, what I can get out of it, I don't care about this person. I just care about what they can do for me. Eventually, it destroys them, and it destroys us, and it destroys the relationship. So the question becomes, why should I love my neighbor, though? If it is so hard, and we know it is hard to love other people, why should we do it? Now, we've heard this teaching before, to love your neighbor, to love people. It all sounds great, right? And one of the most famous stories about loving our neighbor comes from Jesus himself in the Gospel of Luke. And it's the, the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which people have all heard. And we're all familiar with it, that there's a man who doesn't fit in with everybody else and everybody else views him as a terrible horrible person and yet at the end of the story he's the one that is the example of what it means to be a good neighbor and to love other people even when it costs you even when it hurts you even when it's not easy it's a powerful beautiful story of God's love for us and then us extending that love to other people. Well, one of the things that I've noticed is that as I heard that story growing up over and over and over again, and then heard this phrase of love your neighbor, I realized recently that I was doing something with it to try to make it easier. Because we, we always want it to be easier, right? Love your neighbor, like, yeah, that's great. Until you meet my neighbor and to meet the people in my life, then you'll understand why this command is so hard. But what we do is we hear that story of the, great, of the Good Samaritan. We go, oh, okay, well, well he was traveling, and he, and he met someone in need on the road. So, you know, I'll, I'll love people, and, and, you know, they were strangers, so it's only about loving strangers. So I'll, I'll love people maybe when I'm on the road, I'll, I'll help them out. Oh, this person's in need and they're a stranger. They're, they're in a different country. I'll, I'll send some money. I'll, I'll send some help to them. You know, oh, okay, here's this person that needs help. I'll help them. And what we actually do, because we want it to be easier, is we keep the idea of the neighbor at arm's length. We, we keep it at a distance because that distance makes it easier and safer. There's less risk to us being hurt you know in that story of the good samaritan the reason jesus told it is because he was asked the question after telling people love your neighbor who is my neighbor you know and we, we could say the sunday school answer of oh, okay well you know jesus makes the point like everybody's my neighbor i'm supposed to love everybody but you know saying everybody does the same kind of thing it, it keeps it generic it keeps the idea at a distance. So what we really have to wrestle with, the question we really have to ask is not why shall I love a neighbor or, or who my neighbor is, but the question of does my neighbor include that person? When Jesus, when Paul, when the Bible says to love your neighbor, does it include that person? And you know who I'm talking about. It's that, that person that gets on your last nerve. That person that drives you crazy. That person that's betrayed you and hurt you, disappointed you. That person that's wounded you. Does loving my neighbor include them? And see, once we make it specific, instead of we just saying, love my neighbor, we put their name in there instead of the word neighbor. And now it becomes hard. It's still a simple command, love them. But it's hard when they hurt us. So how 
do we do it? Why should we do it? Well, one reason is beyond what's commanded. And the reason that Paul gives us is that it becomes a reflection of the love that Jesus has given to us. So in John chapter 13, Jesus says, I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So Jesus says, okay, love one another. You're like, oh, that's great. That's easy. Okay, the one another is the neighbors. Oh, okay, cool. But if you actually think about it, love one another. He's telling it to the apostles who had plenty of disagreements and plenty of fights with each other. He's telling it to people who will sin against one another. So why does he give us this difficult command? Well, because he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When we love one another, rather than biting and devouring each other and going back and forth in these cycles of revenge and getting even and paying each other back, the world sees it and goes, they've experienced a different kind of love. They've been loved in a different way than the world has ever seen. Because you and I have been loved with a perfect love by Jesus. And so when we begin to love one another and to forgive one another and to serve one another, as Jesus says, in the way that I have done it for you, it becomes this witness to the world that says, there's something different about someone who has been loved by Jesus, who has been served by Jesus, who has been forgiven by Jesus. And then in 1 John, the Apostle John writes this, We love because He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. So John continues the teaching of Jesus, which is, we have been loved with a perfect love by Jesus. And that love changes us and transforms us and sets us free in order to love other people, to love our neighbors, to love our brothers and sisters in the way that Jesus has loved us. And that is a love that changes the world. It's also a love that will change your marriage, your parenting, your relationship with your parents, your relationship with your friends and your coworkers. It changes all of our relationships because it, it frees us from biting and devouring one another. It frees us from the burden of having to get even it frees us from having to just use people to get what we want. Instead, it frees us to love people freely and generously. It doesn't make it easier, but it gives us our why we should do it. It also gives us our how we should do it. Now, what Paul is going to do is he's going to explain to us why it's so difficult Beyond, well, people are people. He says this in verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So Paul is going to explain, why is this so difficult for me? Yes, it's because sometimes they're a jerk. Sometimes they disappoint you. Sometimes they hurt you. 
But at the root, he's saying there's this battle between the spirit and our flesh. So there's a battle between the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, giving us new desires, saying, I want to love others the way Jesus has loved me. And our flesh, which is like Yoda the turtle, says, I want it to be all about me. I want this relationship, I want this life to all be about me, my own kingdom, my own priorities, my desires, what I can get out of it. He's saying those two things are at war. They're in conflict with one another. So the question becomes, how do I win that battle? How do I win that war? So I can be a person that loves others well and serves them and is kind to them and is generous to them rather than being the person that is always self-absorbed and selfish and is trying to use people to get what I want out of the relationship. And so Paul continues in verse 19, he begins these lists that are incredibly popular. The second list, which is summarizes the fruit of the Spirit, is probably a little more familiar to you, but he's basically saying, okay, here's these two ways of living. One is good, one is bad. And these two ways are in conflict with one another in our hearts. So he's going to list them out and then he's going to tell us how do we live the better way. So in verse 19, he says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. So he's saying, the, the, being selfish, being self-absorbed, being a bad person, being sinful in our relationships, he's saying, it's really obvious. Everybody can see when it's happening. And so he's going to list these off for us. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Right, so he's saying, okay, there, there's two ways to live. There's the way of the flesh and selfishness, self-absorption, like making it all about us. And then there's the way of the Spirit. This way of joy and peace and kindness and gentleness. And if you just put these two lists up and he said, oh, okay, well, which life do you want? Well, all of us would be like, well, I, I want the life with joy and kindness and peace in it, right? What kind of marriage do you want? The one with discord and envy and selfish ambition saying, I'm, I'm just here in this marriage to get what I want out of it. Or do you want a marriage that has peace and joy and kindness? And we all say, well, I want, I want this one. Right? What kind of work environment do you want? What kind of friendships do you want? What kind of church do you want? Well, we'd all say, I want this one over here. I want the one with the joy and the peace and the gentleness and the kindness. I want the one where we're actually loving each other and serving each other and forgiving each other. I don't want the one with selfishness and discord and envy and anger and rage. I don't want that kind of life. And the question becomes, well, why do we so often end up with the one we don't want? And how do we get the one that we want, that we desire, that we know is better? And for Paul, and for you and I, the answer always comes down to Jesus and the cross. So Paul says in verse 24, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. And the key here is verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions 
and desires. See, you get that life that you desire and that you want. You get those relationships, you get that family, you get those work relationships, those romantic relationships that you want and desire, that are filled with joy and peace and kind. We get that world that we want, not by trying harder. Not by saying, okay, this is the time that I'm going to get it right. This is the time where I'm going to fix it. You know, that story of Yurta the Turtle, how his kingdom came crumbling down, was by the silly little thing of a burp. I have to think, how many times do our lives get derailed by what we call silly little things? Right? I'm going to get it right this time. I'm going to be better this time. I'm going to love. I'm going to serve better. I'm going to work harder this time. And how many times have you said that to yourself? How many times have you said that to them? And then your plan, your effort, your desire gets derailed by some simple little thing. And so Paul says, You're not going to get the fruit of the Spirit instead of the the works of the flesh by trying harder. They're in conflict with one another. They're at at war with each other. And you're not going to win the war by your own strength, your own effort, or your own power. You win it with the cross of Jesus. You win it by seeing your sins and your shame and your guilt and your brokenness and all your acts of the flesh nailed to the cross and forgiven and redeemed so that you are made new and set free to live a life of the Spirit that brings joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control to all of your relationships. And Paul gives one final warning because he knows we're always going to be at war. That, that conflict always going to exist in us. That's why Martin Luther famously said that we're all sinners and saints at the same time. So he says in verse 26, Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So how do we do that? Well, we take the cross, we take the forgiveness that you and I have received from Jesus, and we share it with others. Because we know when we're going to envy each other, we're going to provoke each other, and we can get stuck in these horrible cycles over and over and over and over again. And how many of us want to be set free from those cycles? of provoking each other, of envying each other, of tearing each other down, criticizing each other. So that instead of doing that, we build each other up. Instead of giving death to relationships, we give life to them. So how do we do that? Well, we take that forgiveness, we take that love, we take that redemption we receive in the cross, and we give it to others. And I want to share with you a practical way of doing that. Because you're not just going to say, oh, okay, well, that, that's great. I've been forgiven by Jesus. Let me just go knock on their door and say, hey, let's hug it out. Because it's not that easy. But forgiveness is the key to setting you free from those cycles of biting and devouring, of provoking and envying. Tim Keller says it this way in his book, The Reason from God, and it's a long quote, but I'm going to share it with you. We're going to go through it. It says, the first option, when we've been wronged, when we've been hurt, in Paul's words, when we've been bitten, someone's tried to devour us, someone has provoked us. The first option is to seek ways to make the perpetrators suffer for what they have done. And that's what Paul talks about. And we devour each other. You can withhold relationship and actively initiate or passively wish for some kind of pain in their lives. 
And there are many ways to do this. You can viciously confront them, saying things that hurt. You can go around to others and tarnish their reputation. And if they suffer, you may begin to feel a certain satisfaction, feeling that you are now paying off their debt. The cycles of reaction and retaliation can go on for years. Evil has been done to you, yes. But when you try to get payment through revenge, the evil does not disappear. Instead, it spreads, and it spreads most tragically of all into you and your own character. There is another option, however. You can forgive. Forgiveness means refusing to make them pay for what they did. However, to refrain from lashing out at someone when you want to do so with all your being is agony. It is a form of suffering. You not only suffer the original loss of happiness, reputation, opportunity, but now you forego the consolation of inflicting the same on them. You are absorbing the debt, taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on the other person. It hurts terribly. Many people would say it feels like a kind of death. But it is a death that leads to resurrection instead of the lifelong living death of bitterness and cynicism. See, there is another option. This is what Paul is teaching us, that there is the option to live in the freedom of Christ, to live in the freedom of His forgiveness and redemption and new life for you. And you can live in the other way of the endless cycles of biting and devouring each other, of provoking and envying one another. And see, at the end of the day, I believe that we all would prefer the life of freedom, the life that Jesus gives. And Paul gives us the answer on how do we receive that life and how do we share that life. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. See, Jesus on the cross absorbs your sins. He pays your debt and he dies your death. And then, through His forgiveness and redemption, there is resurrection. So that I can take their debt. I can absorb their sins because I've been set free to forgive. And I have received a resurrection. I have received a new life in Christ Jesus. And because you have been loved, you are free to love. Because you are forgiven by Jesus, you are free to forgive. And because Jesus has risen from the dead and given you a new life, you can live a life of freedom in the Spirit rather than a life that leads to death and biting and devouring. My hope and prayer for you that you would receive that life of Jesus and that you would live that life in the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for the forgiveness that you give to us. We give thanks for the love that you give to us. We give thanks for the life that you give to us. Help us to be people that live in that forgiveness, that love, and that life that you give. Help us be people that put an end to the cycles of biting and devouring, of provoking and envying, and to be people that give forgiveness, love, and life by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen.